Hi, everyone. Ryan Honeyman here from Lyft Economy. As many of you know, in 2014, I wrote the B Corp Handbook, How You Can Use Business as a Force for Good. I'm excited to announce that the completely revised and updated second edition of the B Corp Handbook is launching this year on April 23rd, 2019. I co-authored the new version of the book with Dr. Tiffany Jana, an internationally recognized expert in diversity, equity, and inclusion. The book now provides guidance on how to dramatically enhance your company's social and environmental impact while ensuring that you center equity at every step. So please order your copy today by visiting lifteconomy.com slash book. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash book. Thanks for your support. And now on with the show. Welcome to Next Economy Now. I'm your host, Andrew Baskin. The goal of this interview series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, democratic, diverse, transparent, and whole systems approach to using business as a force for good. It's not just a matter of hiring people of color, it's also a matter of making sure that they have their full voice, that they're not tokens, that they feel that they belong in the company as much as people from majority white culture. I think we're in the early stages of that, but even making the decision to address that, I think has made a difference. And I think we now see that as a positive value in the way that we saw it as a positive value to have not even just equal representation by women, but higher representation by women because they bring something to the table. And I think that there's an understanding now that different ethnicities and different class backgrounds bring something to the table at Patagonia that we haven't had before. This is our second episode in a series featuring Patagonia's Vincent Stanley, where we explore Patagonia's vision, culture, strategy, and operations. Topics we'll be covering in much greater detail in our upcoming Next Economy MBA. If you want to learn more about that, you can check out lifteconomy.com slash MBA. You get 40% off if you sign up before May 15th, plus an additional 15% off with the promo code hashtag Next Economy Now. Feel free to tweet that out. So our past interview with Vincent Stanley, along with other leaders at Patagonia, including Rose Marcario, Rick Ridgway, and Phil Graves, rank as our most popular episodes, and many folks have reached out to us because they want to know more of the story behind some of the business aspects of Patagonia, in particular, their vision, culture, strategy, and operations, hence the name Patagonia Mini MBA. In the last episode, we touched on vision, and today, my business partner Ryan Honeyman will be talking with Vincent Stanley about Patagonia's culture. One last note before we drop into that discussion, we've kept a pretty consistent format of the show for some time, and I want to give folks a heads up that I plan to continually iterate on the format of the show in the weeks and months to come based on your feedback, as we really want to honor our relationship with our listeners and craft a show that's truly valuable for you. For example, I've been an avid listener of SoCap's Money and Meaning podcast, and one thing I really appreciate about their show, aside from the live panels and inspiring guests that they feature, uh, and side note, I love, we actually have featured some of the same folks like Aaron Tanaka and Lucas Turner Owens of the Boston Ujima Project. Um, Well, actually, our interview with Lucas airs in a few weeks, but one thing I really appreciate is that I feel like the producers of Money and Meaning, Lindsay Smalling and Alex Kravitz, have been really receptive and responsive to some of the ideas that I've shared with them, and similarly... I really want each of you to think about this Next Economy Now podcast as more of a two-way conversation. Your critical feedback is as welcome and encouraged as creative feedback on how we can make the show more awesome, or even fun testimonials about what you love about Next Economy Now that we can share on the show. You can always email me at andrew at lifteconomy.com. So without any further ado, please enjoy Ryan Honeyman's conversation with Vincent Stanley. Welcome, Vincent, to the show. Good to be here. Thank you, Ryan. Why don't we start off with Patagonia's culture, if someone were to ask you, how do you define or what is Patagonia culture? How do you kind of respond to that question? That's a hard question to give a one sentence answer to. And I think that the key to the culture is that we came out of, you know, a small band of climbers and surfers who were the first employees, people who were living, were doing things they really loved to do, and at the same time had strong values about protecting the places they loved. For most of the people, I think originally back in the in the 70s, that was primary and the business was secondary. Now, that's not really true now. But at the same time, I think there's been a survival of people coming to work with their full selves intact. If there's a characteristic shared among Patagonia employees is that they tend to be both cooperative and self-reliant, which is an interesting combination. Yeah. And, you know, with Patagonia's activism, I would almost argue that the business sometimes still feels 
just a sort of a money, sort of a way to make money in order to fuel the activism in a way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, perhaps in some ways more. And it, and it depends on what you're doing at the company. If, you know, if you're, you're working all day long in IT or in accounting, you're aware of the company values and what it does, and that may be a strong motivator. It's a little different if you're working on the environmental team or you're working in, in marketing or communications and, and, and you're kind of on the front lines of this activity of the company, which is really trying to redefine what a business can do in an age of crisis. So we just changed our mission statement from build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm, use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. It's something we've had for 27 years. We've changed it to we're in business to save our home planet. So that is almost a kind of grounding um, for the company. And it's not something you concentrate on every day because you're making products, you're selling them, you're producing them, you're doing everything your focus is still on building the best product, but there's a basic grounding that the purpose of this business is ultimately to do things that will help us save the planet from the current environmental and social crisis. And, you know, how would you characterize the journey? Because in, at Lyft Economy, we see companies at, say, zero to 15 employees. At 15 employees, suddenly the things you were doing with, like, you didn't have any sort of accounting and your, your mom was the accountant to you get about to 15, 20, and you suddenly need like, okay, I guess we should get some sort of accounting system. And then you get to 50 employees and whatever you're doing at 50 or at 20 starts to break down again. And then like a hundred or 250, how was your culture? What have you noticed at some of those key points? Like what's sort of been some of the learnings over the past, you know, few years, yeah. what are some of the things you picked up along those key decision points? You know, th those are usually pain points because you develop certain habits or you develop a way of being with your colleagues. And then all of a sudden you're running a company that's outgrown that way of being and you have to change your habits. And what frequently happens in any company, and what certainly happened in Patagonia over time, is that you, you not only change your habit, you're really changing the whole organizational system. You're changing your computer software. You are adopting habits of a company that's larger than you are. And so what happens frequently is you bring in people from similar companies that are larger that understand the kind of system that you're about to put in. And what's happened at Patagonia when we've done that is to create a certain amount of tension between the people who have been there for a while and the people who are coming in. First of all, I think that there's an atmosphere of fear that uh, people who have been with a company worry whether they're still relevant and the people who are coming in worry whether they're going to screw things up, whether they're able to adapt to what they've learned someplace else to this new culture in this new place. And it takes a while to integrate those groups, either within a, a department in the company or whether in the company as a whole. Uh, but once you do, um, the, the, the dust settles and you're, you're on your way to the to the next pain point <laughs> when you have to once again reevaluate how you operate. I think your analogy is great. You know, you start off, you've got 15 people and everybody's doing everything. And that was a tremendous benefit to us at, when we were Chouinard Equipment and then Patagonia, especially with Patagonia. We didn't know what we were doing. We were all covering for each other and we were all engaging each other to kind of uh, help prod each other to. Uh, figure out what it is we needed to learn. We were going to a, I remember going to our first trade show. And what the hell is a trade show? I've never been to one. Um, how do you make the booth? Uh, how do you plan to deal with the people? And that was something we had sort of all hands on deck getting ready to do that. And then uh, going to, in our case, Chicago uh, Sporting Goods uh, Association trade fair and uh, showing our wares for the first time. But once you get past that 15 to 20, then um, it becomes, and you, you start to uh, have the uh, specialization, labor specialization. Uh, you start to need um, more specific skills to get work done, and your your people have to develop those skills, or and or you have to bring in outside people to help. Yeah, and I think that's one of the interesting tensions for for Patagonia because you know you've 
started off with, you know, we talked about earlier, like the dirtbag culture, and maybe you could define mm-hmm. what that means to folks. Yeah, and yeah Matt, we, maybe we'll talk about the dirtbag piece, and then we can sort of get into like what that looks like at scale or like larger, and how, how do you maintain that? Yeah. Well, originally what that, what, what dirtbag meant is, is what I referred to at the beginning, that people were climbers and, and uh, surfers first. And to give you an example, you know, when I came to work, I was Yvonne's nephew. I planned to work at the company for a few months and then take off. I was not a climber. I was not a surfer. And um, I got very interested in the work um, very early on. I got interested in this little company and our attempt to uh, become a, a clothing business. And I, I, I got into it. But I remember we used to, I used to get a bonus every week. Um, if because you know, found himself in a position where most of his employees would take off for Yosemite on Thursday afternoon to go climbing for the weekend, and then kind of roll back into town on uh, Tuesday morning at eight o'clock after driving all night from uh, from Yosemite to resume the work week. So you ended up paying a bonus of ten percent of of your pay if you actually worked forty hours. Okay, so I, I tell that to people now, and of course they laugh because we're we're, we're a long way from there. But the elements that have survived, I think, are that, uh, first of all, everybody's always been very free to exercise at work. Um, and they're also convivial about it. So people go, they ride their bikes together at lunch or they run together at lunch. Um, we have a, a cafe uh, and people eat in the cafe or outside at benches. We have childcare. So a lot of employees are, are connected to each other because they're uh, parents of children who, uh, who are friends. So there's a social element to working at Patagonia. Um, I think that serves um, the. I, I think it actually serves the uh, the work element because people think about things when they're when they're traveling, when they're on a bicycle, when they're on a run together. When you approach a problem from a kind of informal uh, prism. It's very different than when you're sitting in a meeting and everybody's fairly tense and trying to work something through. So that that sense of kind of being open, the, the, that physicality and that sense of being open to a larger sense of life than, than just what you're doing at work, that has uh, carried over for 45 years. One of the things we talked about briefly before this was as as you're growing, you almost need people who have experience like for example, um, you're not going to hire at a you know half a half a billion dollar company when you were smaller. You're probably not going to hire somebody who has only worked for you know the Sierra Club and a trout conservative. You, know, you sort of need someone with like large mm-hmm. like brand experience. And so, how do you balance maybe needing somebody from you know a large company that you know in 1970 you would have laughed if somebody came to you and said, I'm from, you know, Coca-Cola or blah, blah, blah. And I want to help you. It's like, Oh God, get out of here. How do you then reconcile that with, you might need that person from Coca-Cola's experience at, at scale and retail or, or, or like selling products. Yeah. Well, we, um, you know, it's interesting. There are always a few jobs that you can fill um, with people who are sort of generally talented that don't have the experience, and um, you give them a shot. Now, we, we did this much more early on in the 70s. I, you know, we had a, a friend who was a climber who was a retired pilot uh, who we put in charge of production and said, okay, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're learning on your own. That was my position. I was uh, a young writer, and uh, I, I was uh, thrust into the role of, of sales manager. But I think what happens as you do professionalize is that what you draw, if you're, if you're looking for a specific set of skills, especially if you need to change the way the business system operates, you have to, you have to find people who are um, either dissatisfied. If they're working for a very conventional company, the key is to find people who are, want something more. They want something better. And those people are going to, I think, integrate better into a company like Patagonia or into another B Corp than somebody who's fairly satisfied, especially if they've attained a certain amount of money and, and ranking and they really don't want to 
they don't really don't want to challenge that. They really don't want to change the way they operate. There's also a time, I think, it was much harder for us in the uh, 90s and the 2000s to draw people from the outside. So that if we, if we needed somebody with the skills or the training of an MBA, that person, we had to basically sort of teach that person the culture or uh, allow the culture to teach that person. But the, there were certain things, I mean, there's certain things about a dirtbag culture that actually require some hard skills, like the idea that you're, how do you manage giving 1% of sales to grassroots environmental organizations? How do you integrate that into your story? Those are, you know, that, those, those are, how you do that is a kind of, is an interesting set of skills that we developed at Patagonia. Somebody from the outside coming in wouldn't necessarily know. They would have to pick that up. And it's not just amateur night in Dixieland. It's, it's really rather subtle. Um, when you're telling that, when you're telling the story about your environmental commitment, you don't want to preach. And at the same time, you don't want to, um, stand back. You don't want to kind of hide your virtue behind the pot of plant because specifically you do want to be an example for other companies. Where we've had some failures, I think, are uh, bringing in people from the outside who had impressive skills but really weren't interested or, or worked for companies that we were impressed by, but they, they, weren't able to, um, they weren't able to kind of sit back work with the new people and kind of recreate themselves in this new environment. They tried to impose what they knew before uh, on their new position and with their new colleagues. And generally those folks just don't make it. It's almost like a, you know, a transplant that's projected by the body as a whole. On the other hand, you have people who come from very conventional backgrounds who just thrive at Patagonia. So you've got a, the fellow who runs Tin Shed Ventures who worked for Deloitte. Um, just absolutely loves working at Patagonia, uh, proud of what he's doing, feels like he can bring his full self to work. Rose Marcario, our, our CEO, kind of came to work at Patagonia. She had come from um, venture capital world. She, you know, when she came to Patagonia, she, she tells this story that her attitude was, well, prove to me that this is real. I don't, I'm not quite sure it is. And not only did she find out it was real, but she started to, uh, bring the skills she had, the knowledge she had to make the company more real in a more interesting way. So those are the two. I mean, you got to bring in new people, but um, you don't know whether it's going to work. Uh, and uh, I think that what we look for now, and, and we're better able to do this, is to bring in people who have a combination of the skills and also the values that are much, much more in, in line with, with the companies when they come in. And how do you balance the tension between corporate and a retail location in New York City and uh, another location in Australia and Japan and then a distribution center mm-hmm. in Nevada? How do you maintain a culture across such a different and varied group of people? It's interesting. I think that all of those places that you mentioned, have they're part of the Patagonia culture, but they also have a bit of a local culture. Um, Reno, for instance, has always had We've always had some really interesting people working as pickers and packers, you know, people who are musicians or they're biathletes. Um, they have something else going on uh, in their life uh, and they're supporting that through working at Patagonia. And these are not the most engaging jobs in the world, but they like having the colleagues at Patagonia and they're, they're great what they do. Um, similarly in retail, if you're the, if you go into a store in New York or you go into a store in Austin, Texas, you're going to you're going to get the same treatment. One of the things that's critical, I think, is that if you walk into a Patagonia store and you've had a problem, if you have a if you bought a jacket with a zipper that's broken or you have something that you need to exchange, you're never going to have to talk to more than one person. The first person you talk to is going to help you with that problem and help you walk out with a solution. You're not going to get referred to a manager and the manager's manager. So that sense of agency is at work in all of our employees, including at the retail level. But you will notice a change if you're in Austin versus New York City, um, because the, the, the local people will reflect the sort of cultural inflection of where they are, whether 
uh, you know, the Portlanders will will be like people from Portland. They often um, uh, the, the the people in Austin uh, will reflect the culture of that town. In New York New York City, we have a lot of people who are um, uh, artists and doing other things that would bring them to New York City, or they have partners who are doing that. But overall, you would see you would see that as a kind of as a kind of overlay rather than as a, as a separation. You know, one of the I think challenges for any company is getting the right people. I think I've heard somewhere you tell me this is incorrect, but like 900 applicants for any one position that's open at Patagonia or something like that. Yeah, and, it depends on what the what yeah the what position. position is. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but no, we have a we have a lot now, um, and so that really helps um, because we're able to we're really able to go for both. We're able to go for you know as close a fit as we can as we think we can find. And how does you like the whole "let my people go surfing" philosophy? Uh, how does that play out with a someone in a retail store or a or a picker in Reno? You know, because in Ventura, there's like a there's an ocean, and it's like if you're, <laughs> you know, if you're only, you know, in the early days, I can see it's very easy to just go surf. And but how do you sort of actualize "let my people go surfing" on a global brand? Uh, how does that like flexibility? play into the larger workforce? Well, I, I think the way that manifests itself is that if you're, for instance, if you're working a retail floor um, and you want to take a long trip to go do a climb or um, you want to, you know, we have an environmental internship program where people can go to work for two months with uh, up to two months and the company will, will, pay, will pay the salary while you're gone. So there's a kind of flexibility there to encourage people to uh, that allows people to uh, do things not exactly related to their job. Um, I think in Ventura, there's a very interesting thing that people really do cover for each other. So you know, it's really understood that if the if the waves are firing, you're going to go out and you're going to go surfing, and then you're going to catch up after hours or uh, by working more in the evening. Um, there's also, I think, because of our uh, family-friendly policies. We're really good about you know, parent, fathers as well as mothers get four months off after after birth. And um, there's a long tradition in the company of sort of covering for uh, people who are on leave. Um, so those things, I think, help keep that kind of let my people go surfing culture going. There is an attitude that this is not this is not something that you have to pretend you're not doing. Uh, you don't have to pretend you, you're not running before lunch. It's quite, every, everybody else is doing that and uh, everybody else is going to support you doing that. I'm glad you brought up the, the family leave policy because I think we'll go into that more deeply maybe on the strategy session. But in terms of, you know, the, we, we had talked about this last time a little bit around the, the winner's take all book and Anand Giridharadas mm-hmm. talking about like, you know, it's great for companies to have unique practices that are beneficial to their employees. But, you know, what about changing, like, what about focusing on policy that affects people more broadly? And I feel like Patagonia actually does that on activism. And it's like, sort of, it's not just about, um, you know, we're going to make more environmentally friendly clothing. Like, I feel like you, you really look at, um, you know, what kind of policies can we can we act, can we change? Um, mm-hmm. And so, how does how does like the what is the culture of towards like getting out there and being more engaged? And like, how does that? Um, yeah, like maybe let's let's talk. I mean, I I know we'll probably talk about activism even more next time, but I am curious with this thread. Mm-hmm. Like, how, how does that? How do you approach activism, and what do you view your role as as Patagonia in sort of like addressing environmental issues in the world? You know, I I think the um, I think that the overall evolution has taken a long time. Um, but if you look at, you know, so we came up with that initial mission statement that I mentioned in 1991, and we just changed it last month. And if I look back at 1991, when we adopted the initial mission statement, it was really aspirational, but it wasn't really very true. We, we hadn't yet switched to organic cotton. We hadn't yet introduced recycled polyester. So when we're talking about causing no unnecessary harm, that was there wasn't much to back that up 
we hadn't done much to use our business to inspire and implement solutions. But I, over time, 27 years later, you can look at that and you say, yeah, we did this, this, and this. Um, we really come to inhabit that activity. That is a part of daily life. Every um, manager, if I'm a product manager, I, I know I've got to hit my sales and my margin goals. I know that I have to be as um, I'm responsible for bringing out product that's innovative and ahead of years ahead of the competition. But I also have to deliver more products in fair trade certified factories. I have to solve some of the chronic environmental problems that I've had with my line. I'm held accountable for those things. And my team, I feel it's not that I'm held accountable. That's am, but it's more important that I feel responsible for that. And my team feels responsible for that. So getting back to this evolution, if you, if you look over time that this is now, you know, 20 years ago, the, 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 basically our sustainability department, which no other company had at the time, was served a kind of advisory role in which we would uh, talk to people uh, in production or in design um, or in the catalog about, you know, coming up with recycled paper and high quality. We would help people make improvements. But now you really have every single department very conscious of what the next improvements are and how they need to be made. So the culture at this point, I think, is ready for the kind of larger challenge. We all know that um, the, the planet is in deep trouble. And by the planet, I mean the life on the planet. There are, there's news every day. We know very well in California about the effects of climate change from the fires we've had. We know this week there's a headline about ocean acidification has, um, and ocean warming is happening 40% faster than it's been and was anticipated. Uh, we know where we're headed by 20 to 25 or 2030 if we don't make certain changes. Now, if you work at a conventional company, maybe that's, that's kind of a side issue because your, your, your big concern is how many widgets are you going to turn out this quarter? And if you want to make an environmental improvement, well, that's fine. Uh, as long as it doesn't cost more money or you have this fantastic sense that if you're going to do the right thing, it's going to be balanced against the need to make money and to make short-term profits. But at Patagonia, you have a business model that is actually built on environmentalism. It is actually built in two ways. One, on the activism of the company. It's, it's the positions we take about environmental policy and about uh, and our, our support for grassroots environmental organizations. That's on the one hand. And then on the second, we have 25 years of progressive activity of trying to reduce the harm and make changes in the supply chain. Those restraints, the restraints that we actually apply to ourselves, is, give an example, if you're a designer in a, in a conventional clothing company, you might have 500 fabrics to choose from in a fabric library, whereas a Patagonia designer will have the freedom to choose from 50 because those are the ones that are environmentally vetted for uh, their dyes. Uh, their, uh, their, we know that those fabrics are better environmentally than other fabrics. But our whole business model is based on those kinds of restraints that lead to innovation. So a lot of the products we produce now are a direct product of, of um, are a direct result of us having to inhibit ourselves from doing what every other company is doing and reflecting on what we're doing and then doing something different in order to come up with something that's environmentally advantageous. So that, that is the rough evolution, whereas now this is, I think, that the, the entire um, the basis of the business is built on this kind of environmentalism, both activism and work in the supply chain. Yeah, because I, you know, the, like the tools conference we had talked about and sort of empowering, you know, many folks know you give 1% to the planet. You started that movement, I think 2000 or 2001, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Your earth tax, I think you guys call it. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, um, not only do you give people money, but then you do these, this, uh, can you talk a little bit about what the tools conference is and what some of the, 
the orgs who attend and what's sort of the goal and outcomes of the of the event? Yeah. Well, the Tools Conference we we do every every two years, and we invite um, we pay everybody's way. It's about seventy five people, um, and we bring in people who are really we bring in experts who are really skilled at things that NGOs skills that NGOs need um, fundraising campaigning um, organization. Um, it's a, a three day uh, gathering. We always do at Stanford Camp uh, on Fallen Leaf Lake um, in uh, Northern California, and uh, we do this because we we, we it, it's interesting you mentioned we we helped start one percent for the planet in 2000, but we actually started giving one percent of sales away in 1985, and our model we've always supported small grassroots organizations, um, and and the reason we've done that is because uh, we wanted to support people who are really passionate about a particular place, that a, a particular patch of land or stretch of water, they have roots in their community, um, they have influence, it's very specific work. It's, not, it's uh, not the work of giant NGOs who are working globally or who are working on, on, um, on, on big problems. These are the people, these small organizations are incredibly effective, um, but they also do not attract um, the support of foundations and philanthropists. Um, some of them are no bigger than a, you know, the, the size of a corner church. They have the, you know, three and a half full-time employees, a lot of volunteers, um, you know, a million to five million dollars, or a million or less, or to five million in revenue. So the idea of the of the tools conference is to provide those folks some some assistance that they otherwise wouldn't wouldn't get. It's been very successful over the years. It's actually very moving. I, I, we've been doing it for oh, a long time before I went to my first conference in, in 2011. And, and uh, I was very proud of the company when I participated in that. And I participated in that weekend and I could see um, the, uh, the effect that it made a huge difference for these folks. What's one tool you learned that you didn't already know? Some sort of like organizing <laughs> method? <laughs> or anything like that. <laughs> well, I was on the side. I was on the. I, I I was helping people with their communications. I was helping people with their uh, brochures. So, um, um, I don't know because I I wasn't there to uh, to to pick up tips as an activist. So I I did learn things. Uh, there were some wonderful exercises about how how to deal with um, how activists should deal with legislators, for instance. Um, uh, in going into the office and how you should behave, et cetera. So I really enjoyed the perspective, but I'm not sure there was a specific skill I picked up. That's interesting, considering our current. Do you remember what? They, do you remember anything about what they're supposed to do? That's actually an interesting topic. Well, there was, you know, they they they, they kind of made fun. They were role playing, and the person who was the uh, expert would um, um, imitate uh, an activist, kind of coming in coming in late. And um, uh, sort, of, sort of disrespecting uh, the legislator or the legislative assistant, um, and 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 raise the question: If you were talking to anybody else, if you're talking about somebody who 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 you want to you want to engage their cooperation, you're asking them to do something for you um, about how uh, how to come across when you're when you're doing that. It's one thing to organize a protest; it's another thing to try and uh, influence policymakers. I'll have to try and sneak into your next tools conference. Because <laughs> I think that it's funny because I, I feel like the business community has actually lost touch with some of those types of techniques. You know, we're so, mm -hmm. we're often so confident that just making a better product and doing good through like, you know, improvements to efficiency and like how we, you know, maximize environmental benefit of a product. But it's like, it seems like, um, there's more of an opportunity to be more on the streets and sort of like, not like, like, you know, not um, sort of like just breaking windows and throwing rocks, but like, how do you talk to legislators and try and get an, a policy issue moved? I feel like most business in the B Corp community, I feel like they don't know what that would mm -hmm. look like. So that, that's actually mm -hmm. a really interesting. Uh, yeah, no, that is interesting. So we have a couple of folks in Reno. You know, it's interesting because Reno is a small state. We were very, we did a lot of work there very early on to uh, 
um, try and preserve a lot of public lands, and um, of which there are a lot in Nevada. And uh, so we have some folks who really develop some strong skills and then some strong relationships with uh, with uh, local legislators. Um, but it, it it certainly is true for the for the outdoor industry um, that. They do have, I think the industry itself does have lobbyists, professional lobbyists now. But um, uh, working and kind of figuring, learning how to work in a civic space, I think, is important for businesses. And, and, and not when you're just acting in your obvious self-interest, um, but when you're, when you're working to uh, preserve the, the kinds of things that are important to you to preserve in the world that also uh, help your business to survive. So. Can you talk a little bit about uh, our our good friend, Mr. Donald Trump? And um, <laughs> I, I remember you, I can't remember if we said this on the first uh, podcast, but I think you joked that Rose said like a, a one year under Donald Trump's like a dog year. It's like seven, it feels like seven years. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I heard right, right after he was elected, it was that uh, the presidency is supposed to age the president, not the populace. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe talk talk folks through. I, mean, I don't know if everyone's familiar with your lawsuit, the Patagonia's lawsuit um, about Bears Ears. Can you can you tell that story and like what the latest status of that is? Yeah, I'm not sure the latest status with the origin. We we actually helped. Um, we lobbied and um, and campaigned for the adoption of of uh, Bears Ears as a national monument. It's an it's an area that has been roadless and has been very difficult to access for a long time, which is partly why it wasn't protected beforehand. Um, so in the last days of the Obama administration, it was made a national monument. Um, Trump uh, basically it's decimated, or reduced by ninety percent um, the uh, land included in the monument. Also. Um, uh, cut a lot of territory out of the Grand Staircase Escalante Monument, which is another very remote part of Utah that's very wild and very beautiful. So we uh, we filed a lawsuit uh, to uh, argue. In, in, actually, in the, our position in the lawsuit, our, 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 our standing in the lawsuit is that we're saying this is a this damages our business because this reduces um, the amount of open space in which people can have a wilderness experience. Um, but we're, you know, we feel very strongly because we work so hard. I think we spent a couple million dollars um, on helping various organizations who were lobbying for the adoption of Bears Ears in the first place. Uh, I believe that we've joined suit with some others and then the number of tribes are suing the government and certainly um, uh, the outdoor industry has uh, protested. But these things take a long time to um, to go through the courts, and I'm not sure what the status is now. Yeah, because I mean, and then I think Patagonia, you all were instrumental in getting the outdoor retailer shifted to Denver, right? Which we, is huge. We, that's like how many millions of dollars is that worth to the to the state of Utah? Yeah, that's a pretty big conference. Yeah, it was. I think it was forty thousand people twice a year in Salt Lake, um, and for a four or five day period with with uh, all the money they would spend. And um, you know, we basically uh, pulled out of the show um, during its last year in, in Salt Lake and, and said we didn't, a, after the Salt Lake, after the governor and the uh, congressional delegation in Utah uh, gave their support to um, pulling uh, national monument status from most of Bears Ears, um, we, we, we took that stance and, and, uh, and withdrew. I think another I'm not sure if you already mentioned this, but another, I think the second reason you sued was because of your benefit corporation uh, purpose. Like I think first was um, it'll hurt our business. And second, I think it was like because we're a benefit corporation and it's against our core purpose. I thought that was really, I think it's the first time I've seen a company sue based on their benefit corporation purpose. So that's, that's a pretty cool. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's really, um, it, it's interesting because it, there are a lot of, there are a lot of, I get asked a lot now by entrepreneurs and, and B Corps and uh, not so B Corps about um, activism and about companies taking a stand and 
my my argument is that I, I I think that companies should support should take this should take a stand that's closely related to the kind of business they're in or what or, or what they know about. We know an awful lot about public lands because we've worked with environmental activists for thirty years, and 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 I think at this point we're kind of we're an activist ourselves. We we, we th- these issues are, are are really close to home. Um, if you ask our opinion on um, immigration, uh, particularly for uh, skilled workers, well, we have an opinion and we'll be happy to tell it to you, but it's not something that we can really take a, a, a strong position on because it's outside of our expertise. But, but this is very close to home. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, too, because I was trying to think of which B Corps are publicly activist, and there's not as many that come to mind as I would have thought. Mm. You know, there's um, like seventh generation has done stuff with toxics. Yeah. Uh, you all with environmental, um, but I feel like one of the maybe growth areas for B Corps and social entrepreneurs is we've sort of taken this approach of as um, we're not we're not against anything, we're for something. You know, like uh-huh. we're, and maybe that's maybe in the time of Trump, that's no longer a tenable position to be in, where you're not against anything. Or- or you have to make sure that you're very you're you're more specific, or you double down on the efforts of what you're of what you're advocating. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we we get an awful lot of attention for pursuing Trump. Um, you know, we also uh, we calculated our tax benefit from having the corporate rate from thirty five to twenty first twenty one percent for last year. We figured it was ten million dollars, and we're giving that away. So. There's, you know, there's another instance where we're looking at, um, we're responding to what we think are really bad policy moves. But at the same time, we're very active in the creation of a regenerative organic standard. And if you look at, for, for a couple of reasons, we think that regenerative agriculture, where you restore soil health, restore, restore soil to health, you have a tremendous uh, potential to draw down carbon uh, back into the ground. You are uh, helping to feed people healthy food. And it also relates back to our clothing business. Our our food business is very small. But we're also uh, helping to create this standard. We also apply to uh, farms that grow fiber like cotton and hemp. Um, And I think that more companies can certainly comfortably pursue that kind of work and say, listen, you know, in 2050, the world is going to, what, what, what do we want our business to look like in 2050? How do we want our business to um, help regenerate the health of the planet and also the health of communities? Um, everybody can do that. And you can also, I think it's important to defend democratic institutions. I mean, it's interesting that, that uh, how fragile it can seem from time to time, something that we were all raised to believe was kind of inevitable and would always be with us. Uh, democracy is not looking like such a sure bet around the world right now. So it's important to uh, fight the outrages, and it's also important to defend politically what we love. But I think as business people, it's really incumbent on us to uh, adopt practices that are really going to help the world uh, rather than to uh, continue to uh, destroy its integrity. Yeah, one of the examples of a company that I think is really interesting because it goes outside of its sort of level of, it's outside of its lane, if you will, is, you know, Ben and Jerry's, I've been looking on their website and their activism, mm. is they have, um, you know, they, they actually stood up for Black Lives Matter. They um, yeah. have been big on uh, democracy, like Fix the Voting Rights Act, uh, fair, you know, fair trade obviously does affect LGBT yeah. equality, uh, refugees, you know, in addition to climate justice and GMO labeling. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's interesting how even going outside of that, I feel like maybe some companies, like, I'm just personally interested in how that can be applied in our social business world is like sort of mm-hmm. stepping into maybe areas that we believe passionately about um, and maybe trying to influence policy as well. Right. I think my major concern is, is if companies take stands, take social, social and political stands, are you, are you doing something that you can stay, stick with forever? Or is this something that's just going to be the topic 
I'm not talking about Ben and Jerry's. I'm just I'm just speaking in general about about there's a you know purpose has now become um, a buzzword or kind of fad. And um, so people, if 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 when people start to define their purpose, I I would hope that it has something to do with the core of their their business, something that they can um, keep up and develop over time, rather than treat as a kind of uh, a campaign that they get into and get out of the year too. That's a great point. Yeah, no one can no one can argue that Patagonia has been <laughs> dedicated to environmental <laughs> activism since day one. This is no passing yeah. fad. Yeah, you know, one other I- issue we've talked about too is like this sort of uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and like you know the sort of awareness and consciousness that I think many of us are experiencing around mm-hmm. just you know with the the popularity of social media and this the sort of I almost feel like in a way it must be somewhat like when the um in the civil rights movement and like seeing the pictures of in Alabama of the police like spraying the African American mm-hmm. protesters. Um, you know, social media has done that around uh, you know, police violence and other and so I'm I'm curious with Patagonia, like how do you see the social side of you know, like the environmental justice side, I think like is solid in Patagonia. How do you see sort of like diversity, equity and inclusion and where that fits into the future for Patagonia? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that's been, a, it's, it's been an interesting area for us. The, I think very early on, we had, we've all, we had a high percentage of women in senior positions. And so, and that was something we were proud of. And it's still true. Uh, that if you look at the number of, you know, our, our CEO is a woman, and if you if you look at the the vice presidents of the, the male versus uh, female ratio, I think it's slightly higher uh, among women than men. But the racial diversity has been another matter, and um, there are several reasons for that. One is coming Ventura is not a it's pretty white town, or, uh, white and Hispanic. That um, in the uh, within the outdoor industry there was uh, tended to be white and upper middle class that were making a product that uh, tends to have a higher income uh, uh, upper middle class customer. So when we started to take a we, but a few years ago we started we started to take more of a do some more soul searching on this and I and I think just as we we had an offsite in in Yosemite. Um, a couple of things we started off with were to really look at our internship program and to make sure that that was we were really proactive in making that racially diverse. Um, and then looking at the issues, so it's not just a matter of hiring people of, of color. It's also a matter of making sure that they have their full voice, that they're not, that they're not uh, tokens, that they feel that they're, you know, that they're, that they belong in the company. Uh, as much as people from um, majority white culture do, so we're we're I think we're in the early stages of that. But even kind of making the decision to address that, I think, has made a difference. You know, certainly in our retail stores, we're more we're more diverse because we're we're mostly in cities, um, and it's uh, also starting to be true in Ventura. And I think we now see that as a we see it as a positive value in the way that we saw it as a positive value to have um, not even just equal representation by women, but higher representation by women because they, 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 they bring something to the table. And I think that there's an understanding now that different ethnicities and different class backgrounds bring something to the table at Patagonia that we haven't had before. And that we're going to need um, over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah, it's funny. In conversations with, I've been, this has been one of my main topics in the last several months is just what, what is the role of a white person, a white male in racial mm. justice conversations? Yeah. And I, I actually have, in a weird way, quoted Yvonne, who said, when in, it's like the video launching provisions. He says, uh, nature, love thrives in diversity. Um, right. And he was showing the, the monocrop uh, pictures and then like, you know, what a yeah. rainforest or yeah. permaculture. Yeah. And I was like, wow, like most, like B Corp, most B Corps were sort of monocropsed. We're a little bit too heavy yeah. on the monocrops. Yeah. And, yeah. um, 
we're not even really following what nature actually thrives on in terms of right. racial and cultural and ethnic diversity. So that's been a good visual for me is like, yeah, this isn't just like you should do this because it's, um, you know, we hope it's good for business or it's like, this is the way that, you know, if we model nature, this is the best way. Yeah. To, to get the no, it's thing. a good thing. It's a good thing to do. It's not just that you're removing an injustice. You're also creating, you know, the potential for, um, in, improving, yeah. uh, the society. Um, you know, and, and, and I, I think it's, I, I'm an, I'm not only white, I'm old. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm o- white, old and male. And so, um, it's it's not it's not exactly as though uh, I, I come to the conclusion every morning that my time has come, um, but you know to your point about what is a white person doing talking about uh, racial equality, James Bald James Baldwin said sort of very famously and very right. He said that racism is not a black person's problem; racism is a white person's problem. Um, and he was talking about institutional racism, not just sort of personal attitudes. And uh, there's a um, I, I think it's important for people to come to terms with their own cultural history. Uh, if we're going to do something better than what we've done before, we also have to have some understanding of, of uh, the, uh, what people have done to obtain a certain privilege and how those privileges are, are exercised. My wife and I were in Berlin a few years ago and we noticed in front of every house, um, or every other house, there was a little brass plaque and embedded in the concrete. And those brass plaques they included the name of, of um, a person or, or people who had been taken from their houses and taken to Auschwitz, had the, the name and the date there. And I thought that that was a very interesting way to preserve um, this sense of what was done and what was done to specific people and to make that kind of tangible and real. So it's not something just that your, your, your grandparents did. This country has a, very, has a wonderful history of creating all kinds of opportunities. It also has a history of um, marginalizing and destroying the original population and of bringing um, uh, people in chains to uh, work um, to, to create industrial agriculture in the, in the southeast in the whole 19th century. So what we're dealing with is the is that heritage, which is also the heritage that has led to the kinds of mi- mindset that produces environmental exploitation. And I think we have to deal with both. There's this professor, John A. Powell. Do you know John Powell? No, He's no. a professor at UC Berkeley, uh, law professor, and he's really famous for writing about the concept of othering and belonging. And um, Mm -hmm. uh, I'd asked him on our podcast, he he was saying most people, a lot of people will say the biggest challenge facing our globe is climate change. And what he he says, I thought was really interesting is um, I, he says, I think that diversity and equity and sort of what's happening on this cultural level is the biggest problem because it's creating so much what he called white anxiety about like what we're like, what's happening in our country Mm -hmm. that we're not even able to then address something like climate change because we're so Mm -hmm. it's like, should we build a wall or not build a wall? And like, (laughs) I'm really looking at like this. um, I I thought it was a really interesting point around like, yeah, you know, we can't just say it's everything's got to be on climate change. And why would you even talk about racism or diversity? Uh, Because our, the world is burning. You know, it's it's like this. He was really saying like this is also a precursor sometimes to having those authentic conversations. I thought that was really right. And and if you break down the climate change argument, I, I've had this conversation with 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 some folks. I mean, I think climate change is the biggest political issue, but the biggest environmental problem is the loss of biodiversity. Um, that's the longest. I mean, climate change is related to it, um, but that is the uh, that, that will that will put us under if we don't if we if we don't ex- if we don't change our view of where we are in relation to nature and make room um, for the whole web of life to exist. Uh, dealing with reducing our carbon output is not going to is, is not going to cut it. So to 
the professor's point, I mean, it's making a little different argument, but I, I, I think it is related to that, that you have to really um, have a shift in the way we, uh, the way we see ourselves in relation to nature. And I think that the way you make that shift visible and that you make that shift possible is to engage in activities that show, that, that allow people who have never thought about this to imagine something different. So it may be that everybody's wrapped up in anxiety about, uh, uh, about their past or about their standing in the world. But one way to get around that anxiety is to create positive models that um, show the way beyond that, to show that there is a better way to live. I love that. Well, thank you, Vincent. I, I, again, we always, I think we joke at the end that I could talk to you for hours, but uh, yeah, <laughs> at, least for, at least for today. <laughs> um, maybe we'll call that uh, a wrap. And then folks who are listening, um, the next episode, we'll get deeper into strategy, um, talk a little bit more about Patagonia Works, Patagonia Provisions, some of the marketing and brand voice and brand community partnerships. Next so, Economy Now a lot of exciting is a production of Lyft uh, Economy. Lyft is listening. an impact consulting firm whose mission is to create, model, and share a locally self-reliant economy that works for the benefit of all life. To listen to all our past episodes or to share your thoughts about the show with us, visit www.lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also subscribe to this podcast through iTunes, Overcast, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. It's really very helpful in allowing these ideas to reach a wider audience. Once again, thanks for listening.